All right, what's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in to this month's webinar from Firearms Legal Protection. Looks like we got lots of people tuning in already. Uh, seeing lots of people hopping on through YouTube, some people through Facebook. All right, it looks like we might have just lost Pliny. We're back. <laughs> I think we had a little bit of everybody. Uh, tonight, we will be talking about a very interesting topic, and it looks like we're joining a lot of people all over the country. Looks like Bill Woods was the first person to come Hello from Oklahoma. We're seeing hello from Oregon. Hello from Florida. Everybody, hope everybody in Florida. Hope y'all are doing all right. Storm was was no joke. Uh, hope everybody's recovered and cleaning up. We're gonna go ahead and get on with our topics and housekeeping first. So we did get some questions submitted beforehand. We're gonna go through our talk, talk about how people then we're gonna have a session of variations. So any of those questions. That were submitted before the event. If you sign up, if you actually registered and submitted your question there, that's going to be given priority. But at any point, if you have any questions, just feel free to type them in, or when we're going through questions, put them in and we'll push in the chat. So, with that, tonight I'm joined by James Cook. If y'all have watched many of these webinars, a very familiar face. We've talked about lots of fun stuff, lots of interesting stuff. My favorite ones was when we went through all the NFA items. Short barrel rifle, short barrel machine guns. But James does all of that. He does things from wills and trusts to history of working with the DA to now become cases on his end up in Colorado. So welcome, James. Thank you. So tonight we're going to be going through everything having to do with the Catholic doctrine. And so it's something that I'm sure a lot of people have have heard of, maybe some people learned about it in their concealed carry class or licensed to carry class, whatever it's called in your state. But I think James is gonna help talk through some of the history, what it means, what it doesn't mean, the origins of this thing, so we can all learn about it together. Awesome, thank you. So in order to talk about castle doctrine laws in Colorado, we call it the make my day law, uh, we gotta kind of start historically. And where this really began looking back on it was, uh, ancient English common law, which was adopted in the United States when uh, when we were still a colony. And then once we became our own country, obviously it got adopted in portions. But going back to the 1300s, there was something called the Statute of Northampton. And the idea behind this was uh, that the king's job is to protect the people, the, you know, the subjects of the country. And if citizens or subjects were allowed to use deadly force to protect themselves, it's an insult to the king because it's essentially saying that the king was not able to do his job. And that's where we saw the, the idea that a person had to retreat to the wall before using violence and self-defense came from. Uh, and this carried over into the common law here in the, in the United States. And there are some states where this is still a requirement that before you use deadly force, you have to retreat to the wall. You have to exhaust all other possible options before using deadly force. Other places in the country allow you to stand your ground, to not retreat to the wall, to stand and fight if you decide that that's what you need to do. And that's really where we start seeing a lot of these uh, castle doctrines and stand your ground stuff coming into play. So understand that what we're talking about, uh, stand your ground law, castle doctrine, those sort of things, this is a heightened standard. And it's that if somebody is breaking into your dwelling, you have a better legal defense because of the fact that they are breaking into your dwelling. But in every state in the country, there is going to be self-defense. That is going to be an option that we have. So self-defense, uh, you know, the basic version of that, most states are going to have a law that says that you're allowed to use a reasonable amount of force to prevent you or somebody else from receiving bodily injury. The opposite of that, or not exactly opposite, but the other flip side of that is deadly force. And in most states, actually every state, is going to have a law that says that you're allowed to use deadly force 
when you meet certain requirements. In Colorado, I have to believe that I'm facing eminent threats of death or serious bodily injury, and that I don't have another reasonable means to solve that problem but by using deadly force. Every state is going to be a reasonableness standard. Is it, is it reasonable for you to use deadly force in self-defense? A lot of states now add on castle doctrine and uh, and stand your ground laws, which give you better protections, which say that you don't have to try to retreat uh, or that you are presumed to be acting righteously if you meet the following conditions. So the idea of castle doctrine comes from the idea that a man's home is his castle. That's where we get this, uh, uh, th this name castle doctrine from. Um, and the idea is that simply if somebody has broken into your home, if they have entered in, you are in a heightened degree of danger because somebody has already made that decision that they are going to commit a crime to break into your home. So you should be afforded extra legal protections. And the, the classic English phrase is that a, a king does not have to retreat from his castle. Therefore, a man, because his castle is his home is his castle, man is not required to retreat from his home before using force and self-defense. So we see these laws getting passed across the country. One of the best ones uh, out there is, is, I think, the Colorado one. Um, and we were one of the first that added on civil liability protection, although it has its own quirks. Uh, and we're going to talk about a few examples of this. But understand that just because you may be covered under your state's castle doctrine or in Colorado under the Make My Day law, it doesn't mean that you just get a, a, a free pass to kill somebody that breaks into your home. That is the huge misconception about this. I hear people say all the time, well, if somebody breaks into my home, that means I just get to shoot them, right? No, it doesn't mean that. And in fact, in all of these laws, there is still, even in some of the ones where it creates a presumption that you were justified, it is a rebuttable presumption. It means that the state can still challenge it and say, nope, we think that you were not justified. Here's our reasons why. If you shoot someone in your home, plan on going to trial for this. It's unfortunate, but it's the facts of it. There may be some, some of these laws that are going to get in the way and are going to get the case dismissed early or going to take care of it, but there's absolutely nothing that guarantees that. So a couple examples of uh, castle doctrine laws that, that apply around the country. Obviously, I'm from Colorado. Uh, I am I'm qualified to teach you explicitly about the law in the state of Colorado. I can give some advice about things happening in other states, but I'd really recommend you do, if you haven't been to one, find an FLP seminar in your state. They are going to go over these laws in a lot more detail and explain them specifically for your state in a lot better means than I can do unless you're here in Colorado. So talking about it, let's, let's start with Colorado first, just because that's where I'm most familiar with. Colorado passed our Castle Doctrine Law in 1985. And originally it was going to be called the Colorado Castle Doctrine Law or something innocuous like that. But the legislature managed to get the name changed while I was in committee. And they renamed it the Colorado Make My Day Law, naming it after Dirty Harry, of course with the idea being that no one would actually vote for a law named after Dirty Harry. And fortunately, they did because it is an awesome law. And what the Colorado Make My Day law does is it sets out a four-part test. And as long as you meet the four points of the Colorado Make My Day law, you can have a hearing before your case goes to trial and the case can be dismissed. And if a judge finds that you met those four points of the Make My Day law and the judge dismisses your case, you're to be granted immunity from civil liability if the person you shot turned around and sued you after the fact. Unfortunately, and there are other states that have these provisions in their law, something that a lot of people think is that, well, that means if I shoot somebody in my home, they can't charge me in the state of Colorado or they can't sue me civilly afterwards. And that's absolutely not the fact. In order for the make my day law to apply, you have to be charged. You have to go through the legal process. And in order to get the civil immunity protections under the make my day law, it has to go to a hearing and a judge has to throw the case out. And in, especially in Colorado, what we see is that if you have a good shoot that is going to fall under the make my day law, you're not going to be charged. Prosecutors don't want to waste their time with it. You don't. Prosecutors don't want to see their opponents in the next election saying, oh, look, 
Dan May wasted all this taxpayer money charging James Cook for shooting a burglar in his own home, uh, they would rather avoid that and simply not file charges or dismiss the charges, in which case you don't get any kind of protections. So it's a little bit hollow when they say that you're not going to be civilly liable for things simply because most people don't get that far in the process to get those protections. But talking about the Colorado law, as I said, there's four points to the Colorado law. First, you have to be a lawful occupant of a dwelling. The dwelling is typically someplace that you sleep. It's going to include your house. Uh, it's going to include a hotel room or motel room you've rented for the evening. Uh, apartments are going to count on this. Colorado specifically does not include automobiles. We're going to talk about a couple of states that do in a little bit. But automobiles, even if you're living out of your car, are not covered under the Colorado Make My Day law. Um, next part of it is the person you use force against has to make an unlawful entry into your dwelling. An unlawful entry means essentially they broke the plane of the dwelling. They, they smashed a window and now they've stuck their arm in because their arm has crested the plane of the building. That is going to be an unlawful entry. If they you know kick in your back door and go in through that, that's going to be an unlawful entry. If they enter by deception, they show up wearing a utility worker's uniform and they knock on the door and say that, you know, hey, they're checked to see if you've got a gas leak inside. They get inside and you realize, wait, this person doesn't work for the utility company and now they're here to commit a crime that is going to count as an unlawful entry. Uh, the third point that you have to meet is you have to believe that they're to commit a crime in addition to just the unlawful entry. Obviously, Colorado, uh, you know, we occasionally have the blizzard up here and the legislature was thinking of things like if there is a blizzard, you're out in the middle of the country, somebody, you know, runs their car into a ditch, they get out of their vehicle, they see what they think is an abandoned house and they break in to get out of the cold. You can't shoot them simply because they decide to try to break into your house to get out of the cold during a blizzard. You have to believe they're there to commit a crime. And you don't have to wait until they have committed a crime, but you have to be able to explain that I thought this person broke in to commit a burglary. They broke in to commit theft. They broke in to rape, rob, pillage, do something like that inside. Your own subjective opinion about what you thought they were breaking in to do is enough, but it's something important that you need to be able to make sure that you're explaining why you thought that. I have personally seen cases where people didn't do that and they wound up losing make my day hearings and then winning a trial, but having to pay for the expense of going to trial because they just said somebody broke in. So I thought they were up to no good without explaining it any further. And finally, the, the last point in the, the Colorado Make My Day law is that you have to believe that that person who is broken in with the intention to commit a crime intends to use force, no matter how slight, against somebody that's inside the dwelling. And this is the most important thing to understand when we're talking about Castle Doctrine laws. There is not a state in the country, we'll talk about Texas, which is about as close as you get to this, that says that simply if somebody breaks into your home, you're allowed to shoot them and kill them, no questions asked. Colorado requires that you have to be able to say, yeah, I believe this person was going to, was going to hurt somebody inside the house. It doesn't have to be death. It doesn't have to be serious bodily injury. It could be as simple as this guy is grabbing my wife's purse and is going to shove her down as he runs out the back door. That physical contact between him and my wife when he's grabbing her purse is enough to give me cover under the Colorado Make My Day law. But there still has to be that physical contact or a belief that there is going to be some kind of physical contact. If I turn the, you know, I hear noises in the in my house in the middle of the night, I go into my closet, I grab my eight inch 300 blackout and I go downstairs and I turn the corner into my living room and I see a guy taking my TV off the wall and he's got it under his arm. He's about to run out the back door. I can't shoot him to protect my TV. I still have to believe that there is some threat of violence or force to me or somebody else inside my dwelling before I use that force. But the benefit of the make my day law is that I don't have to believe that the, they're going to kill me, that they're going to you know, kill one of my family members, something like that. I just have to be able to say, yep, he's going to assault me. There's going to be some sort of a violent encounter here. And then Colorado says, I'm just fine using whatever degree of force I believe is reasonable but I still have to meet those four threshold points. And that's the part that a lot of people miss about make my day law, because it's very easy to say, yep, it's my house. Somebody broke in. Obviously they're here to commit a crime, but you still have to have that threat of force against you or somebody else. So a couple other States that I, I went and picked out some laws because we get a lot of questions from Michigan and Texas, uh, Michigan, 
Uh, the interesting thing about the the Michigan Castle Doctrine Law is it, it does not give a whole lot of protections that you think you might have. Um, in the Michigan law, you still have to have a reasonable belief that there is going to be some kind of violence against you or somebody else and that you need to use deadly force to prevent it. But under the Michigan law, if somebody has broken into your home, sorry, let me, uh, <laughs> let me make sure I'm getting the right language here. Uh, if you believe that somebody has broken into your dwelling, you are the common law in the state of a duty to retreat before using deadly force is not required. So if somebody is in your home or the curtilage, I know we got a question about curtilage a little bit later here. If they have broken in, you don't have to retreat at all. You can stand your ground, you can use deadly force, but you still have to believe honestly and reasonably believe that the use of deadly force is necessary to prevent eminent death or great bodily injury to yourself or to somebody else if you're going to use deadly force. Really, the, in Michigan, if somebody's broken into your home, it gives you a much greater latitude to use force to expel them, to kick somebody out of your property. If you want to go up and grab that guy and you know throw him out the door or something like that, and you're going to cause some kind of injury, you're going to cause physical pain, that's going to be very widely allowed under Michigan law. But to simply shoot that guy, you still have to make the argument that, yeah, I thought that I was going to get killed or I thought that I was going to be seriously injured or somebody else was going to be. The presumption is going to be a little bit stronger in your favor because they've broken in. But you still have to be able to explain why you thought that you or somebody else was going to die or be seriously injured. I would say the Michigan one is not a very good example of a, a strong castle doctrine law that's going to protect you like the Colorado one will. Or we can talk about Texas. Texas is uh, in many ways even better. What the Texas law does is uh, in Texas, uh, the Texas, uh, Texas code says that an actor's belief that deadly force was immediately necessary as described in the subdivision is presumed to be reasonable if the actor, one, knew or had reason to believe that the person against whom the deadly force was used unlawfully and with force entered or is attempting to enter unlawfully and with force the actor's habitation vehicle or place of business or employment so here's the really cool thing about what the texas law does it creates a presumption that the homeowner's actions were reasonable as long as they meet the following circumstances so in texas the presumption is the legal presumption is that if i shoot someone who has broken into my home it is presumed that i was justified because they broke in they made a forced entry they used violence or something like that uh or you know breaking a property to enter my home and i believe that they were uh doing a crime inside that presumption is in many ways even better than what we get out of colorado because in colorado we have to go to a hearing and then we can have the case thrown out if we meet all four of these factors here legally you automatically get a presumption that your actions were justified if you meet those criteria uh, best example of a presumption uh, and how that works is with DUIs. Uh, if you are driving a vehicle and your blood alcohol content is over 0.08 there is a presumption that you are driving while intoxicated it is a rebuttable presumption. You can go to court and you can present all kinds of evidence to show that no, even though I was at 0.08, I've got some sort of thing wrong with my metabolic system and that does not affect me and does not make me impaired to drive a vehicle. But the state has the presumption. They can get up there and simply say he took a test. Therefore, jury, you can find this person is guilty because they took that test and here are the results of the test. In the same way under the Texas law, your attorney can get up there and say, ladies and gentlemen, he met these following requirements. Therefore, you can find he is not guilty because he met those requirements. It's a very, very strong thing. Uh, most other states don't create that presumption in your favor. Colorado certainly doesn't. Michigan certainly doesn't. Uh, I know we had a question about Idaho and looking over it. Idaho creates that presumption as well. And that's a really, really good way that these laws can be set up. But 
understand that presumptions are rebuttable. And whenever you read through these laws, you're going to find weasel words in there. Uh, words like reasonable. Um, you know, what did this person reasonably believe that they were in eminent danger? And, and the reason why I call that a, a weasel word is because anytime that you see the word reasonable or presume or uh, words like that, it is a question for the jury because the jury has to define, has to find that your actions were reasonable. Your belief was reasonable. It was justified for you to believe what you believed. So just because there is these higher level of protection, just because there is a presumption that you were justified does not mean that you can't have charges filed against you and you can't go to trial because the people, the state can rebut those. They can take you to trial. They can try to prove that you were not justified. Um, Texas also does not have a duty to retreat. Colorado doesn't have a duty to retreat. Michigan does. There's a number of states around the country that do have a duty to retreat. And again, go find a local FLP seminar. Go to that. You're going to find that your local attorneys are going to be able to do a much better job of explaining that if you're not in the state of Colorado than I can. And they can explain to you about what exactly is a duty to retreat. But it is a good idea if you have the opportunity to retreat to do so. Um, even in states that do have stand your ground laws, just because the law says you don't have a requirement to retreat, it is going to affect the reasonableness of your actions. In that situation where I, you know, I found a guy that was walked into my living room, I found a guy taking my TV off the wall. All right. If I say that, you know what, I thought he had a deadly weapon. He was going to use it against me because I saw he had something silvery in his hand. I thought it was a knife. I thought this guy could turn around and he could charge me. So I shot him five times in the back. That's going to be really hard to show that my actions were reasonable because A, I didn't take the time to identify, did he really have a weapon or was it a wrench that he was using to take the TV off the wall? He was facing the other direction. Even though I don't have a duty to retreat, I don't necessarily have to announce myself and warn him, hey, I'm here, I'm the homeowner, I've got a gun. It's going to undermine my reasonableness. So if you can retreat, it is always the better idea to do so because of those weasel words that are in the law, like reasonableness and justified and those sort of things. That is where a prosecutor can look at a case and say, we don't like the facts of this. We think that for whatever reason, we want to charge him. And that's the avenue that they're going to do. It. If you have the opportunity to resolve a situation by not shooting somebody, take that. If the only way that you can protect yourself, protect your loved ones, protect your family members is to use deadly force, do it. But understand that's because the reason we're doing that is because the option of not using deadly force is worse than what would happen if you did use deadly force. So uh, duty to retreat. There is no real legal definition of what retreat means. Uh, the, the common law standard was retreat to the wall. So that would mean that I would have to walk away until I had no further means of reasonable means of getting away. I don't have to pull out a sledgehammer and try to knock the wall down and go through the wall. But if I get to a point where I can't walk away any further, I'm pinned in, I can't retreat any further, then I can use deadly force to defend myself. Most states don't require that. There are still a few that in some circumstances will, although generally that's not going to be required inside your home. That's more of an outside the home sort of thing. If I get into an argument with somebody at a gas station and I think that he is going to you know, beat me to death, something like that, I have to try to walk away first before I use deadly force to defend myself. Um, important point on this is a dwelling. Uh, Colorado uses the word dwelling. Other states use the word, uh, I've seen habitation come up a bunch of times. And typically what this is aimed at is your house. A place where you sleep is the idea of what these laws are going to cover. Because again, man's home is his castle. A place where somebody sleeps for the night, that is your castle. You're allowed to use a greater de degree of force to defend it. Other places, your work, your automobiles, that is going to be a state by state decision. Colorado does not extend make my day or uh, castle doctrine protections to your business. The state legislature has tried a few times and has been shut down uh, by the opposing party in there and it's never been extended out to your business. So if somebody was to break into my gun shop and they've got a gun with them and they are threatening me with that gun, 
because they've got a gun, because I believe, and, and obviously they're not just a regular customer walking in with a gun, but I believe they're going to use that against me. I would be covered under the affirmative defense of self-defense. I believe that I'm in eminent danger because I think this person has a gun and they're going to shoot me, but I don't get the better protections of the Colorado make my day law. We also don't apply to automobiles. Um, if I'm driving down the road and somebody's attempting to carjack me and I wind up shooting them, again, I'm covered under the affirmative defense standard, but I don't have the better make my day standard to protect me at that point. Other states are going to be different. Texas, for example, uh, and I believe Idaho almost uh, verbatim copied the Texas statute. So you see it pop up in both of them. Uh, they're going to cover your workplace or place of employment. They're going to cover your automobiles or other means of conveyance. I believe it applies to boats and uh, airplanes as well if you're in one of those. Whereas Michigan, Colorado doesn't apply it that far outside the home. And in all of them, there is going to be the requirement that they have to enter your home. Your front yard is not going to be someplace that you can defend with deadly force. You can defend yourself, but you can't eject trespassers by use of deadly force. So uh, I know we've had uh, definitely had a few questions, so I'd be happy to uh, kind of run down some of those. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go through because both both in the layout with the stream there we go if we can get plenty back uh, i think first of all i think your your distinction of um other places like vehicles workplace i think that's super helpful because i think there's a lot of confusion i know personally i've been confused about where can i carry versus does the castle doctrine apply and so i think that's very helpful to understand that just because i can carry there it may not necessarily apply yep well, let's let's go through um, just one little thing real quick. So a lot of you guys are tuning into this show because you are FLP members or maybe you went to a seminar. Maybe you went to your local gun club or gun range, and that's where you heard about FLP. And then you got an email notification about some. So this may be a little bit of a refresher for some of you. If you're tuning in just because you saw this on YouTube and you're not already a member. We're going to go through some of our plans real quick. Again, this may be a refresher just for the benefits you already have. But if you're not already a member, there's also a link and a discount code down in the description so you can sign up and take advantage of that. Firearms Legal Protection offers protection plans for individuals and for families. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to look at our most common membership, which is available in most states. Some states do have exceptions. Our individual basic membership comes with protection in your state of residence. It also comes with uncapped payment of attorney fees for defense of criminal and civil cases. This protection extends to all legal weapons. The individual basic plan also comes with defense of extreme risk protection orders, otherwise known as red flag laws. It also includes access to our 24 seven emergency attorney answered hotline and access to the My FLP mobile application. We recently added expungement of criminal records on non-conviction incidents to all plans. All plans also include access to digital content and special discounts for FLP members. The individual premium plan comes with all the benefits of the basic plan, plus payment of bail bond premium, payment of expert witness fees, payment of private investigator fees, coordination of counseling support, payment of lost wages if needed during trial, and also incident scene cleanup if that's needed in your case. The family premium plan comes with all the exact same benefits as the individual premium plan, but it extends to your spouse and to any minor children. We define minor children as those 17 and below living with you. Whichever plan you feel is right for you or your family, make sure to use the link in the description of this video to get a special discount on your legal protection. If you have friends and family who are also needing protection, feel free to share that link. Now, let's get back to the presentation. All right, so let's hit some questions. How about it? Yeah. So these are some of the ones that were submitted in advance. So first question is from Jerry, uh, and Jerry is in Idaho. So curtilage is a huge problem I've had with law enforcement in the past. Absolutely, I would love to hear options about how to deal with it. So I guess, if James, if you could help remind us what curtilage is, what it means, and, and see if we can give some help to Jerry here. 
Yeah, curtilage is essentially property that is attached to a house. So if you're thinking about your uh, your average suburban home, that is going to be the yard, uh, the area surrounding the house going out to the street, essentially the lot that you own around the house. If you're talking about you know a large piece of farmland, that's going to be the area immediately surrounding the house that's more closely tied with the house, not necessarily you know the back field out there where somebody's growing corn. And a lot of states do not extend protections onto the curtilage of the property. Uh, the, you know, again, uh, this question was asked by somebody who I believe was from Idaho. Uh, Idaho Code 19202A5 applies to the habitation, place of business, or occupied vehicle. Uh, but it does not necessarily mean that you can use deadly force with the same way, giving the same protections on the curtilage of your property. Curtilage is going to be your front yard, you know, again, outside of the building. And the idea behind castle doctrine laws is if somebody has broken into your home, you should be able to defend inside your home to protect yourself inside there. But if somebody is on your front yard, you're not going to get the same kind of protections that you are going to get if somebody has broken into your home. Got it. Got it. Very helpful. Next question is from somebody here in my home state of Texas. So Jason asks, in Texas, does the boundary of the castle doctrine and your ground extend beyond home itself? That's something you kind of mentioned earlier. Does it extend into yeah. So even in Texas, which has got a very, very permissive uh, castle doctrine, it's got some great protections. It does not apply the same level of protections outside of your home, onto your property, on your front yard, out you know, in the in the driveway, those sort of things as apply inside your home. Uh, Texas requires that for the, you know, the Texas Castle Doctrine to apply, again, a person has to be uh, unlawfully and with force entering or attempting to enter unlawfully and with force, the actor's occupied habitation, vehicle, place, or business, place of business uh, or vehicle. So you have to have an occupied business, occupied home, occupied vehicle. And then if somebody is breaking in, you get those greater protections. But if somebody, if somebody is simply sitting in your front yard and won't leave, you're not allowed to use deadly force to stop somebody from sitting in your front yard. Now, you are allowed to use force to expel somebody. So it may be, again, this is going to fall more into a reasonableness standard. If I have got a squatter that, you know, or a homeless guy that has pulled up with his shopping cart and is unloading his stuff in my front yard about to pitch a tent, I can go out there and I can kick him off my property. And that may include that I'm going to pick up his possessions and I'm going to throw them out in the street. I'm going to move a shopping cart out there. I may grab him by the shoulders and I may push him out into the street and push him off my property. But I can't just shoot him because he is on my property and he is trespassing. Even in Texas, that's not allowed. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, there's one comment on here that I think is kind of a rabbit trail from that, but it's interesting. So I'm going to throw it up. So just well, and he was specifically asking about shooting. But in this context, using force, if you use something like OC spray, bean backgrounds, taser, uh, that's use of force, but not necessarily lethal force. What about something like that in your yard, driveway, curtilage? Yeah. And, and again, consult an attorney in your state. I highly recommend people go see a, yeah. a, a, an FLP attorney in their state. But typically that is going to fall under a reasonableness standard. Is it reasonable for you to use those sort of things? In, you know, the event, the uh, scenario that I just put up there, obviously we've got a lot of homeless people in Colorado They're becoming a much bigger and bigger problem out there, like a lot of states in the country. And if I see a homeless guy setting up a tent in my front yard of my house, I'm allowed to use force to, to take him off. So can I find a jury of six or 12 people that's going to say, yeah, that was reasonable for you to grab his shopping cart and his tent and chuck them out in the street? Probably. That's going to be yeah. a pretty easy thing for me to convince people that, hey, you know, yeah, I needed to use some force in order to get this guy off my property. I grabbed him by the shoulders and I pushed him out of my front yard and into the street. Can I five 12 people that are going to agree with that? Yeah, probably I can. If I go out there and all of a sudden start spraying him down like bear spray, like I'm dog the bounty hunter, are they going to say that that was reasonable for me to do? Probably not, because that's a pretty big right. escalation of the amount of force I'm using. I'm causing physical 
pain to that person. I'm not doing anything necessarily to remove his property from my property. If I was you know, trying to take his stuff off and then he attacked me and I pepper sprayed him. That's a very different scenario because I'm defending myself. But if all I'm doing is causing physical pain to somebody to try to convince them to get off my property, you're going to find that you're going to have a harder time finding 12 people who are going to agree you're justified to do that. Same thing with rubber bullets. And, you know, if I go out there with a baseball bat and whack him in the knee, something like that, I'm just causing physical pain to this person. I'm not necessarily removing them from my property. And that's going to be a real really, really hard thing to sell to a jury. Right. That makes sense because it, it no longer looks as if they are breaking into your property and you're preventing that and preventing harm to yourself. It looks like you don't like what somebody's doing and you're, you're starting to fight. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so question here. So does Castle Doctrine extend to my workplace or business? And I guess, does it make an owner maybe if you're the owner of the business or workplace? Again, that is going to be defined by state law. I can tell you Colorado, certainly it does not apply out there. Other states, it definitely does. Uh, you're going to have to find that out state by state individually. Okay. This one's kind of another another hypothetical here. So does the way you carry or stage your firearm matter? So I think this is probably in the context of once you've gotten into that situation, if you had a firearm ready to go, does it affect the way that this is viewed as a castle doctrine defense situation? Yeah. And, and this is, this is a big question, especially with equipment. I get this all the time. You know, is there a certain way that I have to have my firearm, uh, you know, stored? If I get a, uh, if I put a silencer on my gun, if I put a red dot or a flashlight or something like that on my gun, is that going to make things worse for me? And mm -hmm. understand that it typically, the law is going to be completely agnostic on the question of how do you have your firearm? What kind of firearm are you using? And those sort of things. In Colorado, the law says that if somebody's broken into my home, they, you know, I, it's my dwelling. They broke in. I believe they did to commit a crime. And I believe that I'm in eminent danger of having some sort of physical force used against me. I'm allowed to use whatever degree of force I believe to be necessary to stop them. So it doesn't say in there that I have to use the least degree of force. I have to use the least scary thing that I possibly can. Right. You know, the law says that if I've got a 40 millimeter grenade launcher, I can use a 40 millimeter grenade launcher to stop them. But the problem is going to come back is going to be reasonableness. Uh, again, just because the law says that, yes, I can, I can possibly use deadly force to stop this person. Uh, does that mean that I should shoot them 27 times and then reload and, you know, keep shooting them? Probably not. I need to stop the threat. And that's the reason that I'm, I'm using force there. What I tell people as far as equipment and those things go is make sure that what you're doing is tailored to the job that you're doing it for. If you've got a gun in your home for self-defense, you should have a gun that is designed to use for self-defense. You don't need to have an old, uh, you know, an old pump action shotgun or your elk rifle or something like that. It's okay to have an AR-15 or an AK or a Glock or whatever you think is the best to defend yourself with and have a set up to defend yourself. Have a flashlight on there. If you don't want to burn your hearing out in the middle of the night by shooting it in a hallway, have a silencer on that gun. Have a red dot on there so you can shoot it more accurately. But make sure that these are all tailored to defending yourself and you can explain why you have them on there. Don't have things like, you know, a dust cover that says, uh, kill them all, let God sort them out. Yep. Or, uh, you know, funny sayings, I, I wouldn't have zombie slayer, uh, you know, AR-15s or, or those sort of things on there. Don't have Punisher skulls all over your stuff because that doesn't help you defend yourself. All that does is make it so that now the DA can have a gotcha moment pulling out the rifle in front of a jury and showing it to them and saying, you know, why does this person have funny sayings all over his rifle? Why does he have Punisher skulls on there? Does he think that it's his job to go out like Frank Castle and, you know, punish the wicked or something like that and make all these sort of connections that aren't really there, but you're giving the opportunity for someone to do those things. Uh, and as far as, you know, how should you have your, your, you know, your firearm uh, employed inside your home, obviously be cognizant about uh, state safe storage laws. Colorado just passed a law that if you have any minors in your home, you cannot have a firearm accessible to them or accessible to you. If there are minors in your home, you have to have a trigger locked or locked up in a safe. A lot of states are passing those laws. They become very popular uh, with uh, more left-leaning legislatures to do in the past year. So make sure that you're one, complying with those and two, uh, 
uh, just be you know, cognizant about it. Don't have guns sitting behind every single couch inside your home. But if you want to have one on you know, each floor stashed away in a safe place, I don't think there's really any problem with that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, and related to the safe storage laws, have you ever heard of an incident where somebody acting under the castle doctrine defended themselves, but then something came up about how or where a firearm was stored that caused some other charge or, or changed the way the case, I guess, went down from there? So understand the self-defense is completely separate from other charges. So if I uh, if somebody breaks into my home, I feel that I'm in imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury, and I, I wind up shooting them. That doesn't mean that anything else they find in the home is automatically right. uh, you know going to be washed away. If I've got a pound of cocaine sitting on my uh, my nightstand when they go in there. I may be justified in the self-defense shooting, but I can still be charged for possession of that cocaine. Or if I've got a machine gun, or if they find out that I didn't have the firearm properly secured, yes, they can charge me with that. Now, for minor things like you know violation of the Colorado safe storage law, if somebody breaks into my home and I wind up using a gun to defend myself, the chances of me getting charged with violating safe storage are pretty low. If I do it with an illegal gotcha. machine gun, the chances of me getting charged federally for having an illegal machine gun are pretty high. Uh, if I use a 30 round magazine, that they find that I purchased sometime after the Colorado 15 round uh, limit magazine ban went into place, depending on the jurisdiction, it may be pretty high that I get charged up in Denver, uh, pretty low if I'm down in Colorado Springs that I get charged. But the most important thing to understand is that self-defense is completely separate from any other charges that you may receive there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's good to know. Um, next question. So this comes from a famous story that I think I heard this years ago when I took my, at the time it wasn't even called license to carry. It was called concealed handgun license in Texas. And there was a story about somebody, I believe it was in Southeast Texas. Maybe it was somewhere else in Texas. Um, who shot a fleeing thief. And so can you do this? Does it have anything to do with the castle doctrine? Uh, what, what's the general stance here? Yeah. So uh, Texas, I, I, I searched the Texas code. Uh, the answer that I found on that was that Texas has a, a, a three-part test that you have to first establish that uh, using deadly force is necessary to terminate the trespass. Uh, that second, the deadly force is reasonably necessary to prevent the thief from escaping. And third, you have to reasonably believe the property cannot be recovered by any other method or non-deadly means of recovering the property would expose you to risk of serious bodily injury or death. So there is a Texas statute that kind of outlines when you can use deadly force to stop a fleeing suspect or fleeing thief. But the bottom line on this is don't do it. Okay. The problem is I, I read a lot of weasel words in that. Okay. You, it has to right. be necessary for you to terminate the trespass. Who decides if it was necessary to use deadly force in that situation? A jury. Uh, it was reasonably necessary to prevent them from escaping. Who decides if it was reasonably necessary? Again, a jury. Uh, a person reasonably believes that this circumstance exists. Again, who decides that? A jury. So even though, yes, there may be a Texas statute that interpreted certain ways could justify shooting a fleeing thief, it is not going to be worth it in the long run for you to wind up shooting that person because that is one of those things where I guarantee you you're going to be going to trial for murder on. There's too many weasel words in that statute for prosecutors to go after you. And the big one is if you've got any kind of insurance, it is not going to be reasonably necessary to you for you to use deadly force to prevent that person from getting away right. because the prosecutor is going to say he's insured. He's going to get all of his money back. You have to have something that is extremely rare and irreplaceable uh that there is no way this thing could ever be found again and unless you've got the hope diamond in your house I, I just don't see how you're going to find a prosecutor that's going to say no i'm not going to take this person to trial for murder uh i don't recommend trying to use that particular scenario gotcha gotcha i know there's another i believe it's in the texas use of force statute that also mentions uh, where it mentions, you know, threat of imminent bodily harm, uh, all of those things. One clause in there is uh, theft in the night. And I've heard some people kind of wrongly summarize, well, 
if it's night, then light it up. <laughs> like if it's yeah. night, then then that's the qualifier. But like you mentioned, there are so many reasonableness standards and other things in there that it's not just a day or nighttime rule. Exactly. And, and again, go, go, you know, go, go talk to a Texas uh, FLP rep. They can give you probably a little bit better advice than I can on this. But my general advice, if you're looking for what do I do every time to make sure that I have the best chance legally, uh, don't pull the trigger unless you are in eminent danger of having some sort of violence perpetrated against you or somebody else. If you're thinking, well, I'm just going to shoot somebody because he's breaking in to steal my TV. There may be some circumstances, especially down in Texas, where that could be legally justified. But there's always going to be an opportunity for a prosecutor to say, nope, we don't like this. We're going to file charges. We're going to make you go to trial and explain yourself and explain why you did this and convince a jury that it was okay. And it's gotcha. just going to be much easier if you can say, yep, I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to be seriously hurt. My wife, my kids, somebody else was going to be seriously injured. And that's why I shot rather than protecting property. Gotcha. Well, that's a good standard. Uh, one last question here. So what if you're home having a casual alcoholic beverage? So I guess not like a martini. That'd be a formal alcoholic <laughs> beverage, right? So you're at home having a beer. Yeah. And there is a trespasser. So I guess does consumption of alcohol in your own home, does it matter? Does it affect Castle Doctrine? Does it affect any of the way that this is viewed? Yeah. And I love this question. You know, it's kind of one of those things where I'll say that I'm, you know, at home on a Saturday night watching my alma mater play football. So of course I am drinking very, very heavily because we're having an awful season. Uh, <laughs> and somebody decides they're going to break into my home at that time. What effect is my alcohol use going to have on my decision, whether or not I need to use deadly force to protect myself? And the short version of this is, just because you're intoxicated does not mean you lose the right to self-defense. But being intoxicated brings into question all of your decisions that you made. So in, in Colorado, I have to show that I believe that I was in eminent danger of death or serious bodily injury, and I didn't have a better option to solve the problem. If I'm intoxicated, now the question is going to be, okay, well, why did I believe that I was in eminent danger? You know, somebody can very easily, a prosecutor can easily say, okay, well, he was drunk. He didn't recognize that, you know, this was his neighbor that came to the wrong house. Yeah. Uh, he didn't fully recognize the circumstances that he was dealing with. He didn't fully appreciate the level or non-level of threat that he was facing. And because he was intoxicated, he couldn't come up and couldn't rationally decide what his options were at that time and run through a cost benefit analysis, decide, you know, if I don't do this, what is going to happen to me? There Therefore, when I come back on the stand and I say, here's why I thought that I was in eminent danger. Here's why I thought I didn't have a better option. They're simply going to say, well, he was drunk. He, there's no way he could have rationally thought this through in the way that he's now claiming on the stand. Therefore, he just killed him because he was angry because the guy broke into his house. It doesn't mean that I can't act in self-defense, but it's going to make it more difficult for me to prove my points at trial. And again, that's kind of one of those things where if I can explain why I believe I was in eminent danger of death or serious bodily injury, I believe my wife, my kids, somebody was uh, having a threat of force against them. It makes it a lot easier to explain why I took those actions if I had been drinking. Gotcha. Gotcha. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Just got one here that I think is an excellent point, and it's related to what you were saying earlier. A new TV is cheaper than court costs and possible prison sentence. So yeah. absolutely. Even if you have FLP and all your attorney fees are covered, everything is covered. It's not worth your time. That Samsung on your wall is not worth what you're going to have to deal with in a situation like this. Yep. Um, one other one, um, another question. And, and I think this is one that, you know, it's going to vary a whole lot state by state, but trailers and RVs. Yeah, uh, I, I can tell you in Colorado, we've had cases that were not charged uh, involving people that were living out of RVs and, and trailers uh, where somebody had broken in. However, there hasn't yet been a case in Colorado where somebody shot somebody in an RV, claimed it was make my day and went in front of a judge to have that decision made. Uh, there isn't that case law in Colorado. There may be in your state. Um, you know, I, I just want to make sure that I point out here. I am these are very, very state specific laws. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I see a lot of people asking questions, uh, you know, on the sideline, uh, you know, hey, does, does this law apply to my state? Does this law apply to my state? Um, I picked a couple because, you know, I know we get a lot of questions from them. And, uh, and that's why I went on that. 
If you're in Colorado, give me a call. I'd be happy to explain what our laws are. If you're in another state, go talk to a local FLP attorney. They're going to be able to do a much better job of this. I'm giving kind of a 10,000 foot overview there, and they're going to be able to give you all the more specific details. Awesome. Well, yeah. And if, if we tried to cover every nuance of every state, I think we'd be here all night. <laughs> I think yeah. it'd be, get pretty complicated. So I really appreciated learning about kind of the, the general understanding of castle law, that it comes from English common law. Uh, I think that's something that a lot of people don't really know where it comes from and why it's called castle law and kind of those, those origins. So I learned a lot tonight on that. I think we had some good questions. I think it helped a whole lot of people out. This is a good talk. James, as always, I appreciate it. Is there anything else that you want to add? Uh, want to want to tell anybody before we close it out here? No, uh, just go 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 to a class. Uh, you know, with your local FLP guy, they do a good job. And uh, I, you know, if I was just talking about Colorado, I could have made this an hour and a half discussion on uh, <laughs> Castle Doctrine in Colorado, but unfortunately, just didn't have that kind of specificity that we could get into tonight. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, thank you everybody who joined tonight. Uh, one last thing I wanted to throw in, if you're an FLP member, we have a program called Discount Genius where you can get great deals on all kinds of accessories. And right now it's hunting season. It just opened up in a lot of places. So if you need some camo, Badlands is on there. If you need a headlamp, if you need a knife, if you need anything like that, there's a lot of cool stuff on there. So that's a discount, a look, cool little perk you get as an FLP member. If you're not a member, make sure you sign up in the link below or share that to friends and family uh, who may need this kind of protection. It's pretty darn important should you ever be in a situation like that. So James, once again, thank you so much. It was a great show. Good night, everybody.